listening to Stories from Real Life, a podcast by engaging storytellers for engaged story listeners. Here's your host, author and journalist, Melvin E. Edwards. Hello again, and welcome to this November 19th edition of Stories from Real Life. I'm your host, Melvin E. Edwards. Thanks for joining me on this week's storytelling journey. Our guest this week is Kristen Adele Calhoun. Let's find out more about Kristen before we begin our conversation. On today's episode of Stories from Real Life with Melvin E. Edwards, Kristen Adele Calhoun is a writer, actor, producer, and curator. Her work is inspired by red clay roads, her benevolent ancestors, the Atlantic Ocean, and bloodline healing. Those bloodlines and red clay intersect with the host of this podcast. Stay tuned to find out how. Her television and film acting credits include House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, Elementary, Blue Bloods, The Good Wife, and The Kids Are Not All Right. A proud native of Dallas, Texas, Kristen has lived in Accra, Ghana, Bacalar, Mexico, and is currently based in Massachusetts, where she is the Sterling A. Brown Distinguished Visiting Professor of Africana Studies at Williams College. Let's meet today's stories from real-life guest, Kristen Adele Calhoun, and your host, Melvin E. Edwards. Good morning, Kristen, and welcome to this week's podcast. Good morning, Melvin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about this this discussion yeah, we're going to have today. Yeah. So before we go any further, I want to begin by telling my listeners how we know each other. So about three weeks ago, I received an email from you because you were reading my first book, which is called The Eyes of Texans. Yeah. And that book is largely about my first Texas ancestors, Isaac and Elvira, Isaac and Elvira Blayton, my great, great, great grandparents. And you've written a play called Bloodwork which begins with your great, 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 great grandparents who happen to also be Isaac and Elvira Blayton. So we're cousins. Yes. And and it's also interesting that we're, we're writers and Texans. So I want to find out first, how did you find me? Oh, what a great question. Um, Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I'm delighted to be in conversation and and meeting my cousin in this (laughs) way. It just feels so divine and and special. Um, So how I found you, so I have the book here. Um, My mom told me about it uh, a a couple of years ago. And then I think our cousin Carla had a copy of it that she sent to mom. So this is the same copy that belongs to cousin Carla, but it has all of our highlights and things in it. Um, And then I was traveling abroad. And so it took a while for mom to get it to me. But the book finally reached me. So I'm here in uh, Massachusetts where I'm teaching up at Williams College for the year. And I shipped a bunch of books with me. And so this one has been sitting on my shelf and I picked it up the day I emailed you and was finally like, let me spend some time with that book. Like now that I'm on the other side of the play production and all of that, let me see what my cousin had to say about the family as well. And I got maybe, maybe five pages into it and said, oh, I have to talk to this person, like, right away. (laughs) I have to do some Googling. Um, So I did. I Googled your name. I found your Twitter. And maybe through your Twitter, I found your website. And then I think there was a a portal through the website that sent an email. So, yeah, I was delighted to hear back from you. (laughs) I was surprised and I was excited, too. So uh, I'm sure we're going to both learn some new things about our own families. And that's always Mm -hmm. exciting. So you've written and acted or acted for some iconic television shows, including House of Cards, Orange is the New Mm -hmm. Black, Elementary, Blue Bloods, The Good Wife, and The Kids Are Not All Right. So when did you know you wanted to become a writer? Oh, wow. Well, I've been telling stories my whole life. I mean, some of my earliest memories are in Oak Cliff, in Dallas, um, in the backyard, maybe three years old making up stories and making up plays and sharing them with anybody who would listen. And even if there was no one who would listen, I would still go back there and and do them for myself and the trees and the birds. So that's just been in me. You know, I, um, yeah, I've known that storytelling was a part of what I feel like I came to the planet at this time to do for a very long time. And I feel 
deeply grateful for that knowing. Like, I, I, it didn't take me long to figure it out. And then in terms of when I knew I wanted to be a professional writer, I, I didn't really know that. I, I trained as an actor. So I did my undergrad and graduate school um, in acting, theater studies. And um, shortly, oh, this was actually shortly before graduate school, uh, my pastor, I was living in Denver, Colorado at the time, he sat on the board of an organization called the Black American West Museum, which exists to tell the stories of Black cowboys and, and Black folks in the West, since we're often erased from that narrative. Um, and they wanted to write a play about the first Black woman doctor in Colorado named Dr. Justina Ford. And the museum actually uh, still exists in her home to this day. <clears throat> so they wanted to tell her story. So my pastor was on the board. He knew I was a theater person. So he said, Kristen, uh, we want you to write this play. I said, well, I don't write. I'm an actor. He was like, oh, well, you do theater. That's You can figure it out. Close enough. <laughs> you know, but, like, it's, it's really not the same skill set. Um, but he insisted. Um, and it felt right. My, my father, uh, Dr. Ron Calhoun, was a surgeon, a general surgeon. And I grew up. Um, in his practice, really, like uh, working in his office on spring break and summers. So I had intimate knowledge of what it looked like to be a Black doctor. Even, you know, in the 20th century, there were still parallels between what Dr. Ford faced in the 19th century and what my dad faced um, in more present times. Uh, so, yeah, it felt right. And so I did write it. And we had a sold out uh, weekend of shows for Juneteenth. Uh, there in Denver, which does a huge Juneteenth celebration because there's so many Texans that have migrated that way. Um, and the show got extended and we, you know, couldn't sell enough tickets to that show. It was called With These Hands. And I think that was, it was either 2008 or 2009. And then I went on to Rutgers for my master's and the local branch of the NAACP there, somehow I was connected with them. And they also had all these stories from elder members who had lived through the civil rights movement and they said, we want to make a play out of this. Can you help us make a play out of this? And I said, OK, again, not really exactly what I do. I, I'd have one successful go at this thing. Um, but that show was also incredibly successful, sold out show that we did at Crossroads Theater um, in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And from there, I felt like, oh, I might be all right at this. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> the people that I'm writing about and writing for uh, which is Black folks, particularly Black folks um, either in the South or from the South with connections to the South, are resonating with what I'm writing. They're, they're feeling seen and affirmed and loved and challenged by what I'm writing. So, yeah, I might I might stick with this. So finish my um, master's in acting. And then on the other side of that, just um, had more writing opportunities that came along the way. That's interesting. That's really interesting. So what project are you most proud of? Oh, most proud. Ooh. I mean, probably blood work, you know, to be able to say, which is the, the play that I've written about um, eight or nine generations of the women in our family, uh, to, to be able to say that I can trace the, the names of my ancestors seven generations back is really powerful and a privilege and something I don't take for granted as an African-American descendant of formerly enslaved people. Um, and the way that work um, has moved through the world and has touched people all over the world. I've, I've read it, uh, pieces of it in Ghana, Mexico. I'm reading some of it tonight here in uh, Massachusetts. We just had a, a public presentation of it in New York City earlier this year. And for that, I got all these audience feedback forms and just the amount of people who are like really moved by that particular play. Um, and also just the way it, it insists we remember what our people have been through. Yeah, I, th I think that's the one that's, that's coming to the fore for me. Okay, so let's talk about that play a little bit. So okay. and the play is called Blood Work Again. And mm -hmm. it's about our ancestors, our common ancestors, and, and your individual ancestors. And yeah. you changed the name of the female ancestors, but you didn't change the name of the Durst family. So That's can you correct. explain who the Durses were and why you chose yeah. to keep their real names? Ooh, that's a good question, Cousin Melvin. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I chose the name of the Durst, or, or I changed the name of our female ancestors because I took quite a bit of creative liberty 
with the stories. I was um, not only taking things I'd heard from the family oral history, but uh, also taking things I knew from the moments in time in which they lived that Black women might have faced and bringing those uh, facts together to, to tell the stories. So it felt right to, I kept the first initials the same um, so that anybody like yourself who actually knows the family genealogy could trace who I probably met. Um, but it felt right to change their names. Now the Durst, I did not change their names. And the Durst were, was the family in Texas and Leon County that um, quote unquote owned our family. Um, so didn't change their names because I didn't feel like I changed anything that they were up to. You know, like it, it felt in, in alignment with the archive and what I was, what I know to be true about enslavement in Texas. Okay. Yeah. When I was writing my book, the, the, my first book, The Eyes of Texans, I kept the Durses' last name the same, but I changed the first names. Okay. And, and so I, I wanted to tell the story. Actually, my intention when I wrote my book was for, to target seventh grade Texas history students. Oh, wonderful. So, so I, I wanted to tell a story first without traumatizing them. So I didn't go into mm -hmm. the graphic details but I thought adults could read between the lines. Mm -hmm. And I figured the Durses still had some descendants alive. And my intention wasn't to target them or anything. It was, it was to right. tell a story accurately, mm -hmm. as accurately as I could, and still make it interesting yeah. for mm -hmm. a seventh grade mind. Yeah. So again, and you're I talking about taking some liberties. And sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes creative literature, you have to Mm -hmm. Sort of fill in some spaces that you may not may not be able to do from the um, documentation. Right. Yeah, and I feel like you did an amazing job of that. Like, okay. yeah, the way that you combine the facts that we know, but then also um, expand those facts out and create full human beings. Like, even something as what some people may be perceive as something as small as names being misspelled in the census how you're able to like open up what that would mean on an emotional level to a man you know like I, I just I was really stunned by the ways that you were able to expand on the the little bits that we do know and find like really rich humanity in those moments it was really powerful wow I'm honored thank you I appreciate that yeah, yeah, I, yeah I really absolutely. hoped I wanted to get, again, give humanity to the names. And, and a lot of people don't even know the names of their ancestors. A lot of black mm -hmm. people don't know the names of their ancestors. And I wanted to give them, give the reader a sense of what their daily life may have been like. Like mm -hmm. they weren't working all the time. Yeah. What, what were some dreams they may have had that they weren't able to fulfill? And how could those dreams have been passed on to the next generation? So yeah. with that in mind, what do you think Isaac and Elvira Bladen would think of you? Oh, wow. What a question. I hope I am making them proud. I think I am, you know, to understand that in not that much time, we've gone from enslavement to, to someone like yourself in, into the Texas Capitol, you know, into like the highest echelons of government. Um I'm here at Williams College in a, a distinguished professorship, visiting professorship. Um, I think they must be incredibly proud of us and all of their descendants and what we managed to accomplish. And again, in not much time. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope. And, and it's kind of, um, not kind of, but it is a way that I, shape my life and, and make my decisions is, you know, thinking always, is this a decision that will make my ancestors proud? Uh, the ancestors that I knew, the ones closer to me, like my grandparents, my uncle, um, and those that I didn't know uh, personally, but feel like I know through the archive, through my meditations and, and sitting and asking, because for blood work, I really did sit and ask um, each of the women in my bloodline, which story do you want told? And how do you want me to tell it? And is there anything you want to reimagine from your story in the name of healing um, and, and offering that back to them in a way? So, yeah, I hope they're very pleased. I, I think 
our ancestors must be incredibly strong to have pushed through the archive for both you and myself to be compelled to, to create these um, genealogical stories that began there with Elvira and Isaac. Like that was just remarkable to me. Absolutely. So um, uh, as you mentioned, you're currently the Sterling A. Brown Distinguished Visiting Professor of Africana Studies at Williams mm -hmm. College. How yeah. different are North and East Texas from Massachusetts? Oh my goodness, that is a great question. <laughs> I was having dinner with a friend last night, and uh, as I mentioned, I've lived around the world, but this is the greatest culture shock I've ever experienced. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, truly, culturally, it's extremely different. Um, I'm used to you know, the simple things like uh, just when you walk in up the street and you say good morning to folks, generally in Texas, people will say good morning back. And here it's a, it's a whole different world. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that's been a huge piece of the culture shock. It seems so simple, but just that um, basic human interaction, that warmth, that hospitality that we talk about in the South, I have struggled to find it in abundance here. I found it in some smaller one-to-one -one interactions with uh, lovely people that I've met, but collectively it's, it's very different. Obviously the weather's very different. Um, we had incredible foliage this year. So it was beautiful to be able to see that in the fall, but you know, with Texans, we're very proud people too. So there's no place like home. <laughs> <laughs> there's nowhere as good as home. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been wild. And there's um, also a, just a, a covert type of racism here that's very different than home too. At, at home, I generally feel like, okay, I know kind of off the bat whether or not I'm welcome in a space. And generally I feel welcome in spaces in Texas. Um, and here there's, it, there's just, you know, a different vibration. So um I'm very fortunate that my students are so brilliant and so sharp because they have made the experience here in Williamstown just beautiful. That's great. So yeah. what is the what does the East Texas red clay mean to you? Oh, what a great question. Red clay means home. You know, it it means uh, when I think of red clay, I think of fishing with my grandparents on their land. Um, I think of being, and, and by grandparents, I mean uh, on my dad's side, and because both sides of the family are from uh, East Texas. So spent a lot of summers in a tiny little town called Lodi, uh, running through red clay, making mud pies, fishing, uh, cleaning off our shoes for um, when we got home, and then getting up and going to church in the morning. So it just, it brings back, it elicits such um, beautiful memories of home and warmth. Um, good food, good people, laughter. The red clay brings all of that to mind. And, and then when I think about the redness too, I think about our blood being in that soil. You know, you hear um, a lot of people saying in moments like this, you know, I'm, I'm ready to leave the country. And then you hear other people say, I'm not going anywhere. My, my people fought for this. Our blood is in the land. I feel like the, the red clay in a way is a visual representation of that. And Something that strikes me, too, in my travels is the other places we find the red clay. Like when I traveled to northern Ghana, the red clay was there. And understanding that a lot of our people came from those northern villages were marched down to the coast of um, a place like Ghana, taken on the ships across the Atlantic and then down and through the south. But the ways that the red clay connects us throughout the diaspora um, is something that I feel deeply. I was in Bermuda last month and they had um, like some streaks of red clay there too. So wow. yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's like a, an earthy uh, element of connection. <laughs> it's like a threat. Yes. It's like a threat. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, so whenever I see it, I feel a sense of like, oh, my people came this way. Or my people are here. You know, you, I see it when I go through Georgia and uh, on mom's side, my mom's dad's side, we have family people there. Anytime I see it, I'm like, okay, my, my folks are somewhere around. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so here's you. a story I think you'll find interesting. Okay. Uh, because of the research that I did 
in the documentation that I was able to collect for my first book, uh, a couple of years ago, I applied for membership for the Sons of the Republic of Texas, mm-hmm. and I was and I was accepted as as a member. Mm-hmm. And the reason I applied was because I wanted to make the statement that this land and its history are ours too. Mm-hmm. So that same year, I had the privilege of being the first black member of any legacy organization to lay a wreath at the Alamo oh, during wow. a ceremony. And I did that in honor of Isaac Blayton, mm-hmm. Amos Jones, who was Louise's mm-hmm. husband, and then Penn yeah. Edwards, who was my ancestor on my dad's side. Okay. So, and even if no one else there knew why I was doing it, I knew why I was doing it. I, I knew I had a good reason yeah. t- with these real names that represented real people. And mm-hmm. I, I felt like I was there for them. Yeah. That's uh, so powerful. I, yeah. And I think it's so important that we reclaim um, the word Texan. Like even in, in who, when we think of Sons of the Republic of Texas, you know, like who does that include? Even though that, you know, organization has all kinds of history that we might not agree or align with, but I, in my work, it's really important to me that when people hear Texan, that what they imagine includes us too. Because oftentimes it, it absolutely does not, particularly for people who are not from Texas or never been to Texas, but that we are such an important part of the Texas story, you know? So that's, that's amazing that you were able to do that particular type of reclamation work. Yeah, there are more stories about that. I'll tell you offline, but that that, yeah. that was my that was my main point. I can't, so, and I'm also really curious about how you did your research, how you found the names for the eyes of Texas or Texans I, rather. I, I will actually. That leads into my next question. So, okay. um, gene, genealogy research is so difficult and so much different when you're trying to find black ancestors mm-hmm. uh, before 1870. If you were enslaved, your name was not listed in the federal census. And then after 1870, the names were listed, but the spelling or the birthdays could have been wrong. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you find or did you have any particular emotions when you were researching your family's history, especially after you were able to gather records from the Lone Star Slavery Project? Any Um, particular emotions go through you? Just, I mean, anytime I sit with the archive of our people, I'm, I'm often overwhelmed emotionally um, with pride, understanding what we went through, um, but also sadness, <laughs> understanding what we went through. And to see our ancestors' names um, in a slave ledger, um, well, that was really powerful because when I reached out to the Lone Star Slavery Project, it just so happened that the first county that he digitized was the county where our people were. Wow. And it just so happened that this multi-page document that he sent me, our ancestors were on the very first page. You know, so it just felt so divine. Um, if we talk about emotions, I felt like I was in deep alignment and on the right path. I felt a deep sense of gratitude that our ancestors would show themselves to me in this way and trust me with this information in this way. Um, And that's been true for for as long as I've been working on this particular work that whenever I ask a question or go looking for information, it emerges, you know, that the, the things are there when I look for them. Even being able to trace the family back seven generations on mom's side, I just, started asking my mom questions and then I would say, okay, well, who was big mama's mama? And she would answer that. Who was her mom? She's like, I don't know, but I think there's a book somewhere in the attic. She would go pull down an obituary, you know, that Mm -hmm. had the information. And all of the information happened to be in the house. It was just a matter of me. Right. (laughs) It's just a matter of me being curious and asking. And then what we didn't know, we called people like my cousin Carla and um, my great aunts, uh, Tiny and Tot, and by the end of the day, we had it. We had it all. So it was, yeah. I, in terms of emotions, like great pride, um, but also there's the sorrow of understanding the circumstances and some of the horrors that they faced. Absolutely, 
And to, to go back to the question you were asking me about how I did my research, um, mine wasn't as, as quick as yours seemed to have been. It, mm-hmm. it was drawn out over about a 30 year period. Oh, I, wow. I started doing genealogy research in 1988. I went okay. to, um, there's a, a very large genealogy library in Houston. It's actually the second largest one in the world after okay. uh, the one out in Salt Lake City, Utah, which is connected to the Mormon church. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went there and I would find tiny slivers of information. And they were, they were literally like pieces of puzzles. So I would, mm-hmm. I would find a piece and then it might take me another year to find a connecting piece. And then it might take five years to find another piece. And part of the difficulty was whichever particular year I needed for the census. Obviously, people, most people know the census is only done every 10 years. But mm-hmm. the archives are only released every 70 years. So it, it, essentially, they consider that a generation and, and that it's made public. But one of those um, records for Texas had been destroyed or had been lost mm-hmm. in a fire. So I had to wait another 10 years before the previous record was released and then try to fill in the parts in between. So it was it was a very challenging process. And then, but obviously once the internet came along and, and, and information was available online, it, it made it a little, it made it a lot easier, not a little easier, it made it a lot easier. Yeah, that's incredible. And blessings to you for sticking with it, you know, in the, yeah. in the pre-digital age, especially. Yes. And you actually have to go, <laughs> go, go and look for books in the library or the card catalog. <laughs> yeah, line by line, looking for names and information is, is remarkable that you stuck with that. Yeah. And we talked about emotions. Um, even as recently as when you shared with me the um, archives or the, the, the list that you have. It, mm-hmm. I had to wait two days before opening the file because mm-hmm. I had to pre- mentally prepare myself. Um, when I see things like that, it's, it is just so real. And it's, it's not just real because I realize they're my ancestors. It's real to me because that's a part of me. Like mm-hmm. I'm seeing a part of myself there. Yeah. And when I started writing this book, this was during COVID. So I had lots of free time at home. (laughs) So I started writing and my objective was to write 500 words a day. And then when I got to the story about Louisa, that was, it was keeping me awake at night. So I realized if I, if I wanted to be able to get sleep again, I had to finish that part of it as quickly as Mm -hmm. possible. So I started writing 3000 words a day for about a week. Oh, wow. (laughs) And so I, I ended up writing that that whole I wrote that whole book in like three weeks. And oh, wow. I just had to get it out. And and it was it was it was temporary, but it was traumatic for me. Like mm-hmm. thinking of a parent losing their child and then mm-hmm. having to take the initiative of of finding a way to reunite their family, which almost never happened. Right. When once during during slavery, once a family was dismembered. Mm-hmm. that person essentially was dead because they would never be able to see that person. They would never be able to reconnect. Yeah. And how the fact did you that, know? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, how did you know of that story in the family I, oral history that he went I, back for her? I, I heard that story when I was a kid and, mm-hmm. and then it sort of stuck in my mind. I didn't think about it for years. And I started asking older relatives mm-hmm. if they had ever heard that story. And they had, and, and but that story seemed to be the consistent story that I heard from different relatives. And there were other stories I heard and I did research and the documentation just didn't support the narrative. So mm-hmm. I, so I didn't include those, okay. but I, I saw enough there with the Louisa story that I thought there had to be some truth to it. Yeah. Same. It was the one story from that part of the family history that was consistent and also just like was so loud. Like this, uh, at least for me, I think you told it more closely to the actual facts of what we know. And I, I took more creative liberty with it, but I was like, it just felt loud and like it, it needed to be told. Yeah, yeah. just for, for my listeners out there, the story we're talking about is Louisa Bladen, who later uh, married Amos Jones and became Louisa Jones. Um, she was, when she was a, uh, a teenager, she was taken away from her her family, um, sold to another 
planter in Louisiana. And eventually her father, Isaac Bladen, found her and brought her back home to Texas. So that's mm -hmm. those are the facts that we that we know. And that's I consider that the hero's tale of the book, the hero's mm -hmm. tale of our family, Isaac being that that dogged determination that he was able to find the strength to get there, find her, bring her back, and then have her mm -hmm. live to be 99 years old. That's and that, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's so, so what kind of, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it's miraculous to your yeah. point about these things just don't happen. You know, in, in my play, I reimagine um, that moment of family reunion happening on a gallows. I, the character's renamed from Louisa to Liberty. And I imagine that she's on a gallows and she manages to um, evade lynching and be reunited with her family, that they come to save her in that moment. Um, and just thinking about these moments, because we, we don't know what they found when they found her there, right? Um, but thinking about these moments in real history that just seem beyond belief. What I wrote was inspired not only by the family oral history, but a man named Lawrence C. Jones, who in Mississippi had decided um, he wanted to build a school for Black children, for Negro children, as they called them at the time. And the white folks in his community didn't like that idea, and they decided to lynch him. So he was there at, at the tree or on the gallows, had the rope around his neck. But he said something to these people to convince them to not only not lynch him, but by the end of the evening, he had collected the money he needed for the school from the same people. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that guy should have been a lawyer. <laughs> right. And, and the school is still there. It's called Piney Woods, uh, Piney Woods something school down in Mississippi. Um, wow. The school still exists. And when I read that and just thought, we need to know these stories of, of miracle, yeah. you know, of something like uh, being reunited with a family member that's been taken or even using the power of word to create transformation. Um, I think it's, it's just remarkable what, what our folks have managed to do and continue to manage to do. Absolutely. So yeah. what kind of feedback have you gotten from blood work? Mm. I mentioned earlier that I have um, those audience review forms, which have been just, I, I sit with them sometime. I'm actually doing a presentation on campus tonight about blood work. So I was sitting with them yesterday and people are just moved by, I think there's something really powerful, even just about calling the names of our ancestors or just visiting these different moments in time and just, and just sitting with each of those moments in a play. Um, so people are moved by that, but, but blood work also has a through line of healing for black women in particular thinking about the ways in which that racism impacts our bodies, like things that show up in our bodies in disproportionate numbers, like fibroids or endometriosis. And, and what are the ways that that may be connected to the traumas that we faced in this country that have never been reckoned with? So blood work is curious about that too. And I think that's been really powerful for audiences, particularly Black folks, to think about um, what does healing look like? And what is our obligation to heal in this generation so that our descendants and future generations don't have to, you know, carry the burden of these things that have been passed from generation to generation to generation. Um, so people have been very um, touched by it. And people also had great suggestions for how to improve it, too. So I'm, I'm thinking about what revisions look like um, always for all of my plays, really. Um, but yeah, thinking about what to incorporate from people's feedback is also a uh, front of mind. Okay. So uh, yeah. you've lived in places like West Africa and Mexico. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the daily situations you've experienced that are inherently different from what you've experienced in the United States? Oh, that's a great question. Daily situations. Oh, I mean, the, the biggest difference <laughs> from the United States is just the level of peace in, in both of the places you just named, the pace of life is much slower. Um, people move to me at a pace that feels much more human. You know, there's people just don't um, 
rush about in the same ways in in day to day interactions, which upon arrival to Ghana was uh, frustrating for me as I was coming with my, uh, you know, American rhythms and energy. But once I slowed down, I was like, oh, this is delightful to to be able to do this thing. And there's just um, much more uh, of a collective spirit as opposed to an individual spirit. Um, The collective is really celebrated. I remember being in Cape Coast, Ghana, the first time I traveled there, I was by myself. I just, I wanted to see the continent. So I went and I remember um, in that area, there's a mini slave dungeon. So I was going to see the one in Cape Coast and I was walking up the street trying to figure out where I was going. And there was a group of girls who were probably like between 12 and 14 and they were selling oranges and they approached me and they, you know, they were asking where I was from. I, I told them I was from Texas and they were like, where are your people? And I was like, I'm here by myself. And they were like, oh, no. <laughs> they were like, we, we can't have that. <laughs> they were like, we'll walk, we'll walk with you. Like, you just can't be alone. That's that's not a thing that we do. Wow. We just walk around alone. <laughs> so it wasn't a safety concern. You know, it was broad daylight. It was just, oh, no, you should be with family or you should be with sisters. You should be with friends. So we'll be your friends since wow. you didn't you <laughs> really with you. <laughs> And they did. They walked with me, gave me oranges. They taught me um, small words from uh, their uh, language. And that moment has always stuck with me, like that level of care and community. So to me, that's the, the biggest difference is that if someone saw me struggling with a bag or a door, they would not only open the door, they would take the bag from me and walk with me where I was wow. going. Just the level of... Um, of, of goodness, of everyday goodness from strangers and people not seeking anything in return. Just, I see you fellow human and I, I want to be good to you because that's the way we should be with one another. So yeah, that, that part. And that, I miss that. I miss that very much when I come back. You know? I, I think I need some of that. I need to, I need to go to some of these yeah. places and, and experience <laughs> that for myself. So I watched yeah. an interview with uh, recently of, that you did um, okay. and you called rest a form of reparations. Oh, Can yeah. you explain that concept to my audience? Absolutely. So that, that idea comes from a brilliant uh, theologian, scholar, writer named Trisha Hersey, who founded um, a movement called the Nap Ministry. Um, and she wrote a book called Rest is Resistance, which was a New York Times bestseller. And she's just coming out with her um, second book, which I'm really excited about. But yeah, she talks about how for Black people in particular, Black folks who were the descendants of the enslaved, many of our ancestors couldn't rest. We know they worked from a can't see to can't see, from sun up to sundown, right? And the the time they had for rest was extremely limited. It was scarce. And that took a great toll on, on life expectancy or even took a great toll on somebody's ability to to show up as a parent or as a daughter, if you're, if we know if you're not well rested, it's harder to be kind, right? And and good. Um, So her work is about what it means for us now to reclaim rest and to divest from uh, ways of being, from modes of hyper-capitalism that invite us to grind and hustle. But what it means to step back from that and say, First and foremost, I want to be well rested. And in that, there's actually room for me to dream beyond what I see in front of me. Like when you are well rested, you can literally imagine. And when you're resting, you can dream of possibilities beyond what we have. And I think part of her scholarship and work and understanding her intuitive knowing um, is that we need to rest and we understand a lot of the systems that we have don't serve us. And how do we imagine beyond what we have? When so many people say, you know, this is the way it is. Things can never change, but we know the way things have been. This is a, it's brief, this moment of history that we find ourselves in. Like it hasn't been, um, but for a couple of hundred years that we've had the Industrial Revolution and that we live in the way that society is structured in the U.S. now. So what else have we done as human beings and what else can we do as human beings? I think rest gives me a lot of access to my imagination 
into my creativity. Um, and absolutely, I feel like I'm reclaiming something that was stolen from my ancestors, the dream space, um, and just the ability to say, I work when I want to, I think is really powerful as a black person. Yes. Like, and, I, and I'm going to trust that I'm going to be taken care of. Understanding we do live in capitalism, we do have bills to pay, um, that I'm going to honor my rest and trust that the ancestors, God, the universe will provide and I'll be taken care of. Um, and for me, that's been a guiding principle for the past several years. You talked about writing your book during the pandemic. I also wrote blood work at the start of the pandemic. Um, and it was a very restful process. Like, uh, And then I would also have those nights like you too, where there would be a story that was keeping me awake or an ancestor that was, was keeping me awake. So I would push through that. And then on the other side of that, I'm going down, <laughs> you know, like in, in trying to find that balance. But yeah, thank you for asking me that question. I think it's it's really important. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that answer. And thank sort of you. going off of that, um, how do perseverance and joy act as a foundation for your work? Mm, perseverance and joy. I mean, what are we as a people without perseverance and joy? I feel like our, our joy is one of our superpowers. Our sense of humor is one of our superpowers. Like when you sit with the horrors of what we've been through, as you were saying, like it, it's horrific. Uh, some of the, the things that we face as a people, truly horrific. And even engaging with them in the archive takes a toll and can feel traumatizing. But thinking about like actually living through those things um, without humor we don't have the buoyancy to get through. So I think uh, joy is critical. Um, finding the light in dark times. Um, and that to me, always feeling connected to community and to love. And then perseverance. I think it's something you speak to in your book and something that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to speak to in blood work is this notion that, you know, I might not see it in my lifetime, but I'm going to keep going because it might be better for the next generation. I, I pray and I hope, and I'm dreaming of something better for the, if not my children, then my grandchildren, and if not their kids, then their kids. And I, I feel that when I think about our ancestors, that they dreamt of us here today. And, and, and on some level must have had some understanding of that, that if I keep going it, at some point, it's going to be better for, for me and mine. Um, because it's hard to imagine what else would have would have kept them moving forward through some of those circumstances. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So as we start to wind down the conversation, I have a couple of questions left. Um, first, what are you working on now? Mm -hmm. And then second, how can people check out your work? How can they be a part of, of what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what am I working on now? I've been fortunate in the past couple of years to have some pretty exciting uh, television projects from a writing point of view. Earlier, you mentioned some of the shows I've acted in, but I'm um, working on a TV show that I, I won't say too much about, but I have really incredible collaborators. Um, the producers on that are Gina prince Fifewood, who directed Love and Basketball, and also The Woman King more recently, and Reggie Rock Fifewood, who is her husband and also an incredible brilliant um, writer and director and producer and their whole team is just amazing. So I'm working on a show that uplifts black history in a fun, exciting um, and creative way. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. I'm working on a host of plays. Um, I, I can't even count how many plays I have on my docket right now, um, but all very interested in uh, telling black stories, black historical stories um, from a vantage point of what is beautiful and good and uh, things that we can learn from, from, from our folks. And then in terms of how people can engage with my work, um, let's see, what's the best way to share with people? Folks can visit my website at kristenadelcalhoun.com. And from there, there's um, a portal where people can send me a message and I'm happy to to share any uh, plays that folks are interested in. I'm still, um, like I mentioned earlier, I love the revision process. I'm still revising uh, Black Cypress Bayou 
and blood work. So they're not published quite yet, just because they're, I don't think they're quite ready. Um, but they're enjoying, you know, productions. Um, and I'm happy to share them for folks that want to read them. So yeah, I think those are the best ways. Okay. And I will include the link to your website um, in the description for this episode. Great. So, so our guest today has been writer, actress, and cousin, Kristen Adele Calhoun. Kristen, thank you so much for being here today. This has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. The pleasure is mine. Thanks. So if you would like to read about my family, my books are called The Eyes of Texans, which chronicles my mother's side of the family. And then The Strength of a Thousand Sons talks about my dad's side of the family. And both of those books are available on Amazon. I encourage you to check those out. You can learn about aspects of American history that you may have never even considered before. So that's it for this week's episode of Stories from Real Life. Join us again next time for another great storytelling journey. Until then, don't forget to shine your light wherever you go. That was Stories from Real Life. Join us again next week for another great storytelling journey. See you next time.